Yo, this is DMC and the place to be and the place for all of y'all to be is deconstructing stigma. Welcome to Mindful Things. I'm your host, Trevor Chamberlain. The Mindful Things podcast is brought to you by the Deconstructing Stigma team at McLean Hospital. Help us change attitudes about mental health by visiting deconstructingstigma.org. Well, hello. Welcome back, regular listeners. Oh, yeah, I recognize you. Hey, how's it going? And how are you? How's your dad? Doing well? I've never met you before. You're a new listener? Hi, how are you? Yeah? Yeah, it's cold. It's cold. It's brutal. Well, hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome. Welcome to Mindful Things. For our regular listeners and our new listeners, thank you very much for joining us on this podcast journey. A little update about me, no update this week. We're going to get right into the interview because, well... Let me just break it down real quick. This interview is with an individual who goes by the name of Randall Liberty. Let me uh, give you a bit of background on him. Randall Liberty is a participant in our Deconstructing Stigma campaign and commissioner of the Maine Department of Corrections. At the time when I interviewed him, he was the warden of the Maine State Prison for Men. Randall talks candidly about living with PTSD and how it puts him in a unique position to help others. And Randall Liberty definitely speaks candidly. This interview is really intense. Uh, We did it on the road, so we used a different recorder. It's going to sound a little different, and it was in a room with a fair amount of people, so you're going to hear some questions from uh, other people that were in the room. A bit of warning, again, this is some really intense material. You know, it may be a struggle to get through, but uh, I was blown away by Randall Liberty's honesty, and I hope you will be too. So enjoy. going to write during this interview? You're going to take notes? If I have a mental... Yep. It's emotional. It's not mental. Oh, it'll be both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's start there. Is that? Is there a dichotomy between the mental and the emotional, or do they exist in the same place for you? Uh, same place for me, I think. Yeah. Um, I recognize the, the impact of trauma. I, I, I've been to a lot of counseling. I have done a bunch of research. I understand the the whole phenomena, uh-huh. you know, I get it, but it's still it's, um, deeply emotional for me. I was never hospitalized inpatient, but I did the outpatient program at McLean a few times. And the thing that they keep having to hammer home for me and still to this day is that I need to change the way I think in order to change the way I feel and not the other way around. I'm used to doing it the other way around and it never works. Hmm. Do you so, feel that connection? <clears throat> yeah, so for me, it was um, my treatment was uh, was outpatient also, and I did uh, prolonged exposure therapy and in vivo, and and uh, specifically for wartime stuff. And um, um, I found that to be very effective. It worked well, and um, I did that for about 16 weeks. Every Tuesday, I'd go at one o'clock, and I'd do everything do I could to avoid that because it's painful. It was wartime, like I said, it's wartime stuff, and I I had been. Um, back for a couple of years. I tried to manage that myself, but um, my symptoms really were uh, uh, quick to emotion and, um, and then um, quick to anger. And um, none of those, neither one of those traits really were me prior to, to deploying. And um, every once in a while, still today, uh, around Veterans Day or Memorial Day, if, if I'm engaged in a lot of veterans oriented uh, events, Public speaking events or, or uh, with other veterans, it kind of reopens that uh, that folder, and it can be difficult. And the wife, you know, says, uh, "You need to go get a tune up." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I haven't, but it, you know, it sort of subsides uh, over time, and and uh, once we're kind of away from the veteran stuff. I like what you said about quick to emotion. It's a problem I have too. Mm. How did you express that? Um, so I wasn't. Uh, uh, you know, I wasn't quite to emotion prior to my deployment in Iraq, but um, um, now it was. Um, now it is. You know, when I even now, <clears throat> just opening the folder now, kind of, uh, it's just difficult, and it's just a, it's kind of a deep sadness or uh, recognition of, of uh, maybe sacrifice of, of some of the guys. Not only mine, but um, you know, guys historically that have. 
that have uh, served. It's just a, it's an emotion. It's a deep sorrow, kind of a sadness. Um, I think it's because uh, when you witness, witness it firsthand. Uh, you know, it's not it's not abstract for me. It's a, it's not something. It's not a movie. It's not a it's not something. I, you know, I just uh, lightly witnessed. I, I I I experienced it you know firsthand. And for me, it was uh, um, primarily eighteen, nineteen year old Marines. And um, you know, it's difficult. You know, the the dying that happens in in uh, combat is much different from movies. There's a lot of a lot of crying, a lot of a lot of uh, moaning, a lot of you know calling out for your mother, a lot of. Um, um, it's very difficult, and you, you're trying to save somebody that you deeply care about. And uh, the emotion, the relationships you build in combat are um, unmatched to anything I've ever experienced. It's a, uh, it's a deep love. People that I love, especially my mother, now I'm getting worked up too. Good. I carry their pain mm -hmm. with me. Yeah. Why do you do it? Because I can tell you're carrying not just yours, but a lot of other people's pain. Why do you do that to yourself? Um, I think that uh, it, it's the burden of leadership. I think that um, in the military in particular. Um, but I'm no leader, so what's my excuse? I don't know. I can only speak to my experience, but uh, my burden was was uh, deploying my soldiers and uh, with the implied uh, promise that I'd bring them all home. And then, um, and then leading the Iraqi soldiers, you know, I had uh, 772 Iraqi soldiers and, and, um, and uh, the reality of infantry operations, offensive and defensive operations is, is people don't come home. And um, when you lose people, um, you feel that burden that could you have trained harder? Could you have planned better? Could you have, uh, you know, could you have obtained better weapon systems and, you know, equipment for these troops? Would that have made a difference? You have to make calls that result sometimes in, in, uh, in their deaths. And uh, the, then there's the other piece of killing other individuals. And so, you know, when we rolled into Iraq, um, I'd been in the Army at that time 23 years, but, um, and I was very exposed to, to death and dying. And I'd been, in, I'd been in law enforcement corrections now 20, 36 years, and at the time, you know, 20 plus years. And, and, um, but I'd never been exposed to the violence of war. Um, the raw violence of war, where where people are uh, daily uh, trying to kill each other, and um, and uh, the reality is, is 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 my experience was when we when you kill the enemy, you know the army does a good job of of uh, dehumanizing uh, the enemy that <clears throat> we always have, and um, every I think every generation of warrior calls the enemy some sort of name, and ours was Mooj. We called him Mooj, and. Uh, um, and but the reality is when you when you kill some of those enemy, and then you roll down and and um, search the bodies and you pull the wallet and their 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 children is pictures and wife's pictures and the reality is where they are fighting and the reason he's fighting and trying to kill me is because I'm an infidel in his country and he wants me out. So it's a much more complex than just killing the bad guy from a distance. You know, when for me in an urban environment when you when you're fighting, it's up close and personal and. Um, yeah, I think it leaves some emotional scars, and and um, you know we did a lot. We did a lot of killing, and my guys were killed, and I think that's a, that's where I am today emotionally. You said something earlier, a phrase, something about the raw expression of violence or raw violence. You said that about a minute ago. Yeah. What is that raw violence? Um, you know, so the army, America's very good at waging war, and and um, we have a lot of weapons at our at our um, um, disposal, and so. The damage that a 50 cal uh, machine gun does, you know, that round fires 3,000 yards, and when you're fighting in an urban environment, you're kicking those rounds off. They, those rounds don't stop until they hit something, you know. And uh, um, we also had uh, artillery from Camp Fallujah. We could drop artillery rounds on a dime, and um, yeah, we did a lot of damage with indirect and direct fire. And uh, it's just raw violence, killing the enemy with any means necessary, and and. Uh, it's just very violent, and um, the other thing that weighs on soldiers is the unintended deaths and the unintended consequences of of waging war in an urban environment, where unintended people, um, you know, they get killed, and some of the operations uh, might be, you know, receiving uh, sniper fire from a rooftop, and um, one of the methods we use is we maneuver a squad, five guys lay down suppressive fire on the house, and another team uh, maneuvers. Or you can roll a tank in and put a round on the house and, and soften the target before you go in. Well, the problem is, is if there's a sniper on the rooftop, by the time you've maneuvered all those assets, um, 20 minutes later, the sniper's gone, 
but the residents of the home is still there. And so sometimes, um, you know, good people, unintended people will get killed and that's a, that's a burden. How many directions is your brain going at any given time? Yeah, it, um, I'm on hyperdrive sometimes. And, and uh, the, um, one of the, I think one of the coping mechanisms for any of the trauma I've uh, um, been involved with is uh, stay busy. Stay just rocking busy all the time and, and um, I still do that. But isn't that also a way of not allowing yourself to emotionally process a situation? Or is it a way of maybe just putting it on the shelf for now because I've got this situation that I need to take care of and I'll get to that later? Yeah, I think it's very common with a lot of folks. I think that uh, the Vietnam vet ex vets are experiencing that now where they, they came home from Vietnam, um, had families, worked a bunch of overtime, stayed busy, and, and uh, now when they retire in their 60s, um, they have time to pause and reflect, and I think that that's been a, a difficult time for them to, when you're not busy. And so I, I stay busy. I st I'm, I'm rocking, whether I'm on duty, off duty, and um, um, that works for me. What if you stop rocking? What happens? I don't know. I don't. I don't stop rocking. You know. So I just. I just stay busy. Are, and, um, are you afraid of stopping? I'm not afraid, um, but um, I. You know, I don't like to dwell on it. You know. Um, you know, unfortunately, I made, uh, you know, my family of origin was, was uh, you know, struggled and there's a lot of domestic violence there and a lot of alcoholism and broken homes and all that stuff and poverty. And and, uh, and then I joined the Army and, and I did the law enforcement thing. So um, all of those things produced environments where, um, you know, trauma is the result. And, and in the law enforcement, I did a whole bunch of, of death notifications and I was a rescue diver for 15 years, and I, I pulled a bunch of bodies in lakes, rivers, and streams over the years. And How many bodies? 19. Do you remember all 19? I do. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, those would be... Uh, Those are you know, difficult for a few different reasons, you know. I'd be patrolling, I'd get a call, you know, um, drowning victim, drowning in progress, whatever, and I'd have my dive equipment in my, my uh, trunk, and I'd, I'd have 50, 10 or 15 guys who were certified with me, and we'd scream to the scene, and, you know, often there'd be a mother on the bank screaming, save my children, and uh, um, get out of the vehicle quickly. Um, pull your vest off, sometimes leave your uniform on, throw your BC and tank on, and, and uh, away you go. And, and, you, and, you know, 80 feet of water pull, 18, 19 year old kid. The last one I, I, I pulled is 19. And, uh, um, you know, it's just an awful scene. Pull him, bring him up on shore so you can find some place to do compressions and, and try to save this kid. And, and um, you don't save them, you know, you just don't save them. You try, and, and there's the old ugliness of, um, you know, frothing at the mouth and bleeding, and, and you're breaking the ribs trying to save them, and, and there's just, there's just no saving them. And, um, and other times it was, I've done five tanks looking for people, and again, you know, 50, 60 feet of water, total darkness, and then startled when, they, when you see them. You've got to handle the bodies, and dark, the skin's kind of green colored, hair waving in the water as you pull them. If they're, if they're in a vehicle, done some with multiple, multiple people in the vehicles and you have to handle the bodies and it's, uh, it's unsettling, it's, it's difficult. Um, but I felt as though, um, you know, critical to, to, to try to, you know, recover those bodies for the families. It sounds like the path that you've chosen in life is is constant exposure therapy, yeah. is constant subjection to situations that are going to put push you through your limits, yeah. push you to your limits. And it sounds like that's the place you want to be in. But it also sounds to me like it's the place where you think you deserve to be. Uh, for me, I feel it's the. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm the I'm I'm very willing to to grab a rifle. I'm very willing to grab a tank and, and dive. I'm very willing to 
Um, I think when I was sheriff and I was chief and I was staff sergeant and there was a death notification, I felt it was very important um, to go leave the scene and go to the home and talk to the 55-year-old parent um, and help them through that. Um, I didn't think that it was appropriate that a 20-year-old young deputy who may still live at home um, deliver that um, message. I thought that those were all important things to do, and I still think they're important things to do. I just think that there's a... Um, but why um, do you have to do them? Um, I get why they're important, but why yeah. do you have to do them? Um, I guess I feel like, for me, it's just a reality check that, you know, as a society, when we decide to do something like go to war, or when there's an unmet need like retrieving victims, um, drowning victims, or doing do death notifications, um, you know, somebody needs to do that. And I think I, I was, I am well equipped to do all those things. But I just feel as though I know that there's a, there's a burden as a result of those things. And I'm willing to accept that. It's just the, for me, it's just the way it is. I, um, I'm okay. I have some demons and um, I'm okay. Um, when I open that folder though, and, and I see those bodies, whether it be in combat or diving or many, many suicide victims, um, all of those things, uh, fatal accidents, that's the nature of the business I'm in as an infantryman or as a law enforcement officer or as a corrections officer. Um, we know that going into it and, and I'm willing to accept that um, as, a, um, as a reality when those, in those professions. Warden, I'm not trying to put you through something difficult, but I'm just trying to find the emotional process mm -hmm. when retrieving a body. Yep. The moment you show up on scene to the moment that you go in, where do you, where do you put yourself emotionally to get through that situation? Yep. It's just like, um, it's like in combat. Um, when, when I was in Fallujah, I only, only broke down one time. And because I was a sergeant major, I don't have the I don't have the, the, the liberty to, to be emotional, to, to cry, to, to show any weakness. Um, an infantry sergeant major has to be, follow me boys, we're good to go. And um, um, we had, uh, um, we worked with Charlie One Three Marine Corps Company, who was about uh, 300 meters away from us in the city. They were in one schoolhouse, one in the other, and we fought together for about six weeks. And um, um, in, in January, when things slowed down, um, the Marines pulled out and um, we covered down on their battle space and, and uh, they took off and Dustin Shumi was the lieutenant that I hung out with the most on patrols and, and their chopper was shot down, 24 guys were killed. All 18, 19, 20 year old kids and, and uh, Dustin Shumi was probably 27, he was the adult supervision really there as lieutenant. And um, um, I, um, the way it worked in the city is my 10 man American team had had 150 minutes on our satellite phone to call our families. And so that meant we had, each each of the guys had 15 minutes to call. And if the first guy used 20 minutes, the last guy got 10 minutes, 10. right? And so that's what we had for on a card. And um, I called my brother that day after they were, they, they were killed and the chopper was shot down. And, and um, um, you know, he's a retired uh, E7, um, Sergeant First Class Infantryman. And, and um, I caught him, he was southbound 95, drinking a latte and listening to BLM, heading to work. And it was really, you know, it was so obvious to me that, um, you know, the Army's at war and, and America's at the ball. And, um, hey, how you doing, Already good? I, 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 I told him the story and he said, that was your guys? I said, yep, and you know, I broke down and, and um, but it was just so stark to me that, that America wasn't engaged really. It's those people that are, that are fighting, right? Um, but once that conversation was over, wipe my eyes and turned it off and let's go get them. And, and uh, that was the same with, with um, any of the fatal accidents, any of the diving incidents. Until the event was over, like I'd pull up at a dive scene, pop my trunk, put my stuff on and, and jump in the river. Um, that was pure business mode, searching, finding until you accomplish the mission pull the body, and then when once rescue takes over and takes the body away. So what happens, you go numb, emotionally numb? Uh, you go automatic, you go muscle memory. You go, just like in combat, when, when excuse me, taking fire, as squad leader, as platoon leader, as the battalion sergeant major, 
you'll give them commands. Alpha team, lay down suppressive fire. Bravo team, maneuver. It just it becomes muscle memory with all of that stuff. But um, the difference in the Army is, uh, is we never really sat down, processed it. Um, how do you feel about that firefight? We don't do any of that. We just suck it up and keep fighting. Um, in the law enforcement world, we did a lot of debriefs. And so for the dives, it'd be a lot of, maybe 10 or 15 of us in around a circle debriefing um, with the chaplain. And it'd be a lot of, lot of folks crying and uh, wishing they'd been there 15 minutes earlier. If they could, you know, why didn't they have more air in their tank? You know, what could they have done differently? If they had patrolled over here or if they'd been more ready or whatever it may be, maybe they could have saved somebody. So there's a lot of regret sort of that way, which was unfounded for the most part. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, most of the stuff that, that I've done operationally, uh, muscle memory, do the mission. And then um, when we came back from Iraq, the, then it was, you know, when we were back here and we came, everyone returned home, and it, the game was over. That's when it was, um, became more emotional, more you know, able to contemplate and process all that happened. And that's when you really started to feel the deep sorrow and, you know, and all of that. Do you think soldiers would benefit from a debriefing emotional process, or do you think that would compromise them? It takes a while. The, the, um, I was an Army drill sergeant, too, and, and uh, all part of that indoctrination of taking an 18-year-old child, really, the kid that we don't trust with the car keys, um, and we're going to make him a warfighter, and the whole process of indoctrination, um, you know, um, really about sucking up and driving on. I don't want, you know, I, I'd say I'd, I'd be in the open bay with the, with the privates, and the first couple of weeks they're homesick and I'd walk through at night, they'd be crying because they miss home and, you know, and I would say things to them like, don't contaminate my army with your weakness. You know, that kind of thing. You can't be weak, you can't show emotion, you can't be, you just... Um, Our emotions weakness? Yeah, I think that in the army, in that environment yeah. they are. And so um, it's all about, you know, mission first. That's what the army says, mission first, get the job done first. And, um, and, and you can't do that if, in that environment, you have to shut it off because there's so much violence, there's so much killing, there's so much of that happening that you have to put on this armor of, of uh, bravado, sort of, and, and, uh, and mean it. I mean, uh, you have to be the, um, my mentality when I was over there, I'm the baddest dude in the valley. You want some, come get it. Has your ar armor of bravado ever been shaken? Um, <clears throat> you know, only when I when I pause and I open the folders and I start doing that. Um, no, I, you know, the the Iraqi soldiers there called me the the, the um, probably the best compliment I ever got uh, um, that I've ever received was uh, in the Arabic world they uh, yeah they call you by your name um, until you have a, a son. And uh, when, you, when you have a son, they call you <clears throat> Abu, your son's name, so Abu Michael, and you're the father of Michael. And so um, um, Ahmed, my, my interpreter, said, uh, as I was maybe 10 months in the tour, and he said, do you know what the Iraqi soldiers call you? Because those are my troops, and we fought and slept and ate and cried and laughed together. And, and uh, I said, well, no, what do they call me? And God knows what they called me. You know? <laughs> And they said, uh, Abu Sabotage, father of the 17th Battalion. <laughs> Which to me was, was a huge compliment because it, it felt like they know that I cared about them and, and they cared about me. And uh, we were doing what we had to do and we did our missions and I laid it out there for them. They did for me and it just, we had each other's backs. and. Um, that's the way I wanted. I didn't want to be um, um, a robot, just uh, you know, killing and, and all that. I want to be a leader to them. I want to be the guy that they could come to and they could count on, and they know I was there for them. So, I'm going to jump to something else, Warden. Warden, you have a family. I do. Yeah. How many children do you so have? So I have uh, two biological daughters, uh, 29 and 27, and two stepsons, 24 and 19. Mm -hmm. Have any of them shown any signs of a emotional or mental illness? No, uh, mm -hmm. they've uh, they do well. Uh, Brogan and I talk um, 
she's the oldest and she's a um, uh, caseworker in the trauma unit on uh, in Maid Med. So um, she she manages the social work piece, the families, and all of that. When somebody's rushed in with, you know, life-threatening burns or injuries, or you know, so she deals with some of that the trauma on a daily basis too. So we talk about that. I keep checking in with her. She's a new mom. She has a, a ten-year-old son. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, my daughter Taja um, is uh, married to a soldier, and, and they're in Korea right now. And and she has a 22-year-old month, 22-month-old um, son also. And um, you know, I, she struggled the most when I deployed. You know, they were 10 and 12 when I was gone, and so very difficult to say goodbye to them. And and, um, and uh, when I was in Kokush on the Iranian border, it was very quiet, um, and there's no, there were no, there was no news. But when we when we were deployed to Fallujah, um, you know, the Anbar province, Ramadi, Fallujah, Haditha, that area was in the news all the time. And um, she was very worried about it and she had to get some, some, some counseling for anxiety and that kind of thing. Did you ever talk about it with her? Yeah, yeah, we, we talked about that and, and um, how difficult it was and the burden of that. She also, um, her husband deployed to Afghanistan and so I helped her through that. Um, that was a challenge. Um, my wife, Jody, um, she's a, uh, she worked for Child Protective as an investigator. Oh my gosh. And so, oh uh, yeah. So she did that for a while. and That job is no joke. Heavy, heavy. And then uh, she, she transferred from there to adult protection. And so now it's, uh, you know, those two most vulnerable um, um, populations, the children and the elders that are neglected and abused and, and exploited. So she works for that. So we, you know, we're able to talk to each other about that. Her clients and my clients, same folks. We know the same people, same. I, I know most of the people she deals with and the people are exploiting them. And um, so we chat about that a lot. Um, yep. When you were there for your daughter, when her husband was deployed, how were you there for her? Um, so um, she came home for a bit and um, we were able to um, you know, process that um, and she did well with it. And um, when she went back to Fort Polk, which she did most of the time there, the year is gone, talked to her all every day, texting, messaging, that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, I get it, she gets it, we all understand it. We've, we, we went through my deployment and his, and he's a mechanic, so he wasn't um, directly engaged daily, but um, That still, job is hard. Yeah, it is hard, and, and, and they were doing a lot of convoys, and convoys get hit often, so, um, yeah, um, we, we got through it. I think that he's okay, um, and so is she. Mm -hmm. So what brought you into corrections? Um, 1985, when I came off active duty, um, uh, um, I did three years and active duty, and I I knew I needed to go to college, and that was my intent when I when I enlisted. I, I when they asked me what I wanted, I said I want to be a military policeman. I want to um, I want as much money as I can get for college, and I want to do a three year gig. And they kind of worked it out for me, and and um, and I so that's what I did. And and um, but I recognized in the army early that. Uh, um, the way to advance is, is a combination of hard work, dedication, uh, stick to itiveness, and, and, and education. And um, so I did. I came off active duty in '85, and I stayed in the Guard and Reserve, and I did an additional 21 years in the Guard and Reserve. Um, but um, while I was in school, um, I had to work, and so um, I worked at the Fairfield Police Department as a my first municipal law enforcement job, and I also worked at uh, the Somerset County Jail, and so that was my first. Um, non-military correctional environment was at Somerset County and um, I worked there for four years when I was going to college and so that was my first exposure to civilian corrections and um, and while I was there my dad was there so um, I applied for for the job and, and is your uh, father still alive yeah no he's passed mm -hmm. um, and so um, Sheriff Wright was the sheriff at the time he was a former marine and so we hit it off and and uh, and um, he said yeah I'll hire you do you have any questions for me and I said uh, yeah just one my dad's in, in the jail right now, and is that going to be a problem? And he said, not a problem for me if it's not for you. So um, so that's what I did. I guarded him for three or four months there in, in Charlie and Delta Pod. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have an official diagnosis? Uh, Post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. yeah. How does PTSD manifest itself in this job being the warden of the Maine State Prison? Uh, it's beneficial in that this industry has a lot of folks that are impaired with um, post-traumatic stress. Some of them are veterans, some of them have been here for 
you know, in addition to the combat tours, there are, they've also endured the, the violence here. Uh, in the last month, we've had um, three staff assaults, um, one stabbing of a staff member. And uh, these, guys are, these guys are working in, the, in an environment where uh, there's constant compression, always looking over your shoulder, you know, who's following you? Uh, where are you, someone's hands? When we're on the mile and when someone approaches you, take your hands out of your pocket. So it's a constantness of that. So it's a benefit that um, I've had that exposure and um, I have... Um, and it's something that you impress upon the people. Oh yeah, are. we talk about it a lot. And um, we talk about um, the fact that it's, um, you know, we need to talk about, we need to process it, we need to bring peers in, we need to do mentorship. Um, it's a natural response to being involved in a correctional environment um, with these, these dangerous folks. We've got a lot of guys that are here for homicide and significant violent um, um, crimes, and uh, these guys live with them every day. And you never know when something's coming. And um, so it's beneficial that way. Um, as far as um, um, how, it, I don't think that uh, it impairs me at all. I, uh, I'm involved in everything I get my hands on, you know. So if anything's going on, I want to be involved. I want to help the guys. I want to back them up. I want to, I want to jump in if I have to. Um, I want to be involved in all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think you being so open with your history, your past, and what you suffer with helps? I hope so, yeah. yeah. And I wouldn't say suffer. Really, you no, wouldn't say suffer? I'm, I'm, I'm my good. gosh, I'm, I'm like, good. I'm ten, I'm ten percent of no, the man no, that you no, are. No, 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 I'm not. I don't. Um, I'm okay. You know what I mean? I'm all right. I um, um, when I open some folders, I get emotional, but I um, function very well. Um, I'm good in, in in my off time and and professionally. I I do well. I'm okay. I'm not looking at you suspiciously. I'm just in awe of this. I don't know about awe, but I'm telling you, I, I am I am good. I need some of what you have. <laughs> Can you put it in a glass and I get it? I don't know, to but I, you know, I'm all right. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm I'm okay. Uh -huh. I enjoy this job. I enjoy leading. I enjoy being involved in the um, in the industry. I'm good. It feeds me. Explain that. Um, you know, I need to be, um, I, what I do... Um, do you need to be on that edge at all times? Is um, that your comfort zone? I don't know what edge, zone? but I mean as far as um, I need to be uh, doing something that has meaning and purpose. And um, I do understand that. Yeah, and, I, and that's one of the things I told my, my kids all the way through um, their childhood. And, and adolescent, I tell them that today. Um, that, is, that I need and they need, they should seek out things that have meaning. And, um, and Brogan and Taj have both done that. Taj, my youngest daughter, is a nurse. And um, um, and they find meaning in that. My wife finds great meaning in the work she does. Um, it um, I I can't. I don't want to go to a job. I do not want to go to a job and, and earn a paycheck. And that's not that is not important to me. And so I feel like here in the correctional world, it's our duty to. I think guys arrive here because uh, they have mental illness, they have substance abuse issues, they have trauma, they have learning disabilities. Um, any any combination of that um, describe them and us. And I feel like it's our duty to try to identify those things and, and fix those things, not only for them, but for the families. Um, you know, the, the whole criminal justice system is, is a family affair. If someone's addicted, uh, the previous generation and the, and, the, and the next generation are impacted by that. And I think that any of the work that we do here, that we can avoid them um, from making the same mistakes and traveling down the same road that, that brought them here, helps their mother and father, helps their children, and has good meaning, and, and also doesn't re-victimize folks in the community. Most of these guys are going to get out, and so I find meaning in that. I, I do. I find meaning in that. Can I just ask one question? Is, do you think it's a coincidence that your whole family ended up in some sort of service, like public service? Yeah, I don't know. There was always my mother. Um, you know, my mother dropped out of school in eighth grade, and she had um, my my she was pregnant at the time, so she had Ron at at fifteen and a half, and and uh, me at uh, I think seventeen and nineteen and twenty two and. The dad was in and out of jail, and but anyways, in the end, she went back and, and picked up her GED, and then she went on to 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 go to school, and and she became a um, um, consultant for young mothers, and so she would travel with KV Cap um, to homes of young mothers and teach them how to be mothers, because usually there was a break in the in the generational, you know, maybe grandma wasn't around, maybe mom wasn't around, and right. how to nurse, how to care, how to deal with a colicky baby, and she had five children of her own, and so that was her thing, and so she felt like she was, you know, it was a perfect job for her. Right. And she did that, you know, so a lot of us have done a lot of the public safety stuff. I have of my four brothers, uh, three of us in the Army, um, one was a combat medic, a paratrooper, and, and in fact, uh, 
he got out, got out of active duty, and did the same thing, went to college, and he's a nurse practitioner, and he works here. And, um, and then my brother Ron retired, 20 years service, and um, we laugh about my brother Ryan. He's, a, he's the only one that didn't go in, and, and uh, we laugh with him, I should say. Um, all of us have had this, this um, exposure to a lot of trauma in our careers, and, and uh, he's an executive sales, you know. <laughs> and he's, he's a virgin to all this, mm-hmm. really. You know, he's had no exposure to it, and it's, you know. And do you treat him differently because of it? <laughs> Yeah, you know, he's a different guy. He, yeah, he's a different guy. Well, no, he's, great. he's a great guy, great yeah. father and all that, but he's just, a, he is a diff- it's a different world. Yeah. You know, um, when we talk, it's just different. You know, I talk about a stabbing that happened today, and he looks at me like, what? And, uh, like, he, uh, like I've been looking at you yeah, throughout this whole interview? Yeah, he scored a, a big account. Yeah. You know? And, <laughs> well done. You know, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. But for him, and, and he always talked to my daughters and to all the, the, the nieces and nephews about, don't do the teaching social work cop stuff. There's no money in that. Get into business. That's where the money is. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Who cares where the money is? It's not about that. When it's all done, who cares? You know. And um, so we, we we always had that. And my mother was very much, uh, you know, get into social work, teach. You know, to all the all the daughters and all the all the, her grandchildren. And they've all done that. You know, one's a PhD, uh, she's a psychologist now, and, and the others are nurses and social workers, and you know, so it's a victory for her. You know. Do you think that's a problem overall that there's too many people going to where the money is? Yeah, you know, obviously it's about a ba- about balance, but some of the benefit of, of 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 traveling overseas. I spent 14 months in Korea, and I was an 18 year old kid, and and um, and my daughter's there on her second tour now with her husband and. And the Koreans, it was it was really transformational for me. F- small things like just appreciating um, life. So, uh, like a spider would go across the floor, and and Americans would be jumping on, not you know, killing the spider, right? And um, or or teenage boys have BB guns shooting all the birds they can, sh- they can kill. Whereas the the Koreans would would say, whoa stop, pick up the spider, walk it outside. And it's life. They they appreciate it and the depth of that and. The, the depth of appreciation for elders. Um, my my roommate Hong Song he, you know the 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 Korean soldiers would make five dollars a month, literally five dollars a month, and I was making six hundred, so I was loaded six oh nine, and um, and so uh, when as military policeman he was my translator. We would go into villages and we were working gay shacks, and uh, I'd buy him lunch and we'd go back to the gay shack and there would be Korean National Police and security guards in that in that shack, and he would go to the elder and say, would you like some of my lunch? And um, we may do that as Americans, but I'm thinking, I hope you don't take any, because I want the whole thing. <laughs> and um, the elder would take the whole sandwich, and then he'd see the, find the next one, and he'd take the apple, and he'd take the chips, and, and then until it's all gone. And I'd say, Odigayo, what are you doing? Why would you do that? I bought that for you. And he said, Korean custom, it's, uh, we honor our elders, and, and we mean it, and I'll eat later. And he wouldn't eat all day, and he'll eat tonight. Mm-hmm. And um, just truly respecting um, elders and, and each other and being more thoughtful and mindful. Um, it's just a stark contrast that we see often here in America. You know, even the Iraqis were leaving sim- leading simple lives. I think that their average wage was $2,400 a year when I was there. And uh, we were paying them $400 a month. And um, they had multi-generational homes, grandparents living with them. The elders were respected. They would help raise the, the grandchildren to be their mentors. And they live very simply, but they live rich lives, mm-hmm. as opposed to us racing off working 60, 70 hours a day and uh, a week and um, trying to find that balance all the time, ever having time to do those things that maybe are more important and more beneficial to the community and the family and you know that. So I was trying to you know, strike that balance, I think. Yeah. Anything here at the prison that you see or experience that you find to be triggers? No, I don't think so. No? Even, yeah, even... Um, no, I'm okay. I know you're okay. <laughs> no, I don't, you, I'm not. You proved that within the first five minutes. No, no, no. I'm a, I'm, nothing really bothers me here. No, yeah? I'm good. Yeah. I hate to see, what I don't like to see is I like to see my staff get assaulted and that sort of stuff, you know. Talk about that some more. For me, <clears throat> it's difficult. And, you know, one of the, one of the challenges of, of uh, the unfortunate sides of... of climbing up the chain and gaining rank mm-hmm. is uh, I'm sitting here and I'm watching the monitor, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, one of my jobs is I'm supposed to, when, when things get stupid and there's a fight or an assault that happens, we call it an ICS and it goes over the radio and we all hear it. 
And so everybody has a job. It's kind of like going to Iraq. When, when we get hit, there's a, the thing's called battle stations. Everybody has a place to go and a mission to do to, to do it right. And my, my job here is to make sure that if, if something happens, an emergency happens, I set up a command post. And so here I am with all the resources. I communicate with central office. They bring in resources. We all communicate about what, how we should do whatever, okay? Um, and uh, one of the things I do poorly is I don't do that. Don't tell him. But I don't, <laughs> he knows this. When that happens, I yell to my deputy and say, ICS, something happens, um, I'm going in. And so, so that's what I do. I feel, you know, I feel those guys in the pod, you know, the way we do corrections is... is I'm sorry, could you explain the pod? Yeah, a pod is, a, is a, say, a pod of, uh, say, 74 people, in, in inmates in one unit. And so... Uh, um, what we do is uh, the, the way corrections is, is run today, the best practice is, is we do direct supervision. So you have one officer who is in a, in a pod with, let's say, 70 inmates, and they're all in their cells. And, and what typically happens at 6 in the morning, they pop all those doors. And so you have 70 inmates with this one officer. And the, often the officer is a 19-year-old, 20-year-old kid, and he's trying to manage those inmates. And... and uh, um, and even the most difficult inmates, up until I don't know six six months ago, one officer was in there, and um, assaults happen, and it's very difficult. So I feel like I want to be down there. If something happens, I want to be in the mix. Do you feel trapped up here sometimes? No, because I go. Mm -hmm. I just go. You go. Yeah, and then uh, my shift commander comes up and says, "Warden, what are you doing? You're supposed to be." You know what I mean? I said, well, "Ross has it." Or if uh, we happen to have, if they, we happen to be inside and something happens. Um, we need to get out, so we, so we have somebody outside, and I'm always, I always send my deputies out. Aren't you compromising the chain of command by going in? No. They can, <clears throat> they can do this. They can manage this. You know what I mean? I'm telling you, you go in that, um, <clears throat> everybody in this room will, will know that um, it doesn't make any, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to put, a uh, you know one twenty year old kid with seventy of the most difficult inmates in the state of Maine, uh, proven violent offenders, guys that committed suicide uh, homicides, some have committed multiple homicides, and so if the budget um, um, warranted it, um, we should have three or four people in there. We should have three or four people in there managing those inmates, and um, there's and it's not beyond best practice. That's what we do nationally. We throw a 20-year-old kid in there, and that's what happens. But that, um, that doesn't mean that we'd want our son or daughter to be in there, you know? So um, why isn't there more than one 20-year-old kid in there? That's the way it is. That's, that's, that's the industry. That's just like, um, you know, when I, when I worked in law enforcement in the county, 890 square miles, 30 communities, Seven of, the, seven of the communities have police departments, so the Augusta, the Waterville, they have police departments. They remain, so there are 23 towns, and um, how many police officers do you think in those 23 towns? Four. Two troopers, two deputies. And uh, at midnight, the troopers go in. You have two deputies out for 23 communities. And so we divide the river, and, and you literally be 30 minutes running lights and siren to get to the to for backup. You know, so does that make any sense to have a 22-year-old cop out there, a domestic violence situation, or shots fired, and he's out there by himself? No. No, not, not really. No more than asking a 20-year-old Lance Corporal to run 10 men in Fallujah by himself 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, with, with a bunch of teenage boys running around. So it's just that nature. It's, a, it's the nature of the job. So I feel like um, I want to be there to help in any way I can. Sometimes we have an I, a, a ICS that happens in the an event or a fight happens in the gym, you go in there and there are three officers back to back at center court. And there are 300 inmates in that, in that court and you make eye contact with them and some of them are looking like, maybe we want to do something, you know? I imagine if you have to go in there, yep. you have to go in there with a look on your face. Oh, you have to go in the alpha male. You have to go in there and if you're in that center court, well, those two other officers, in particular, those two officers have to look at you, whether it's myself or Ryan or whoever's in charge inside there, they have to look at like, you like, um, I look at them and say, follow me, I got your back. We got this. They have to know that, just like in combat. When I'm on the berm and I'm looking left and right, I've got 18-year-old Marines, and they're scared. 
you know, they're scared because they know, you know, people are going to die. You look them in the eyes and say, follow me, let's go. You have to have that mentality. If they sense, if they sense fear in me, um, you know, the, the war's lost. You know, so you have to you have to be that leader that provides that confidence for them. I've got your back. I'm there for you. I'll suffer and endure with you. I'll lay it out there with you. Um, do you like ice cream? I do. Every night, I lay in the recliner and it's sitting on my belly. What flavor? Why do you see this? No, I don't. <laughs> um, uh, uh, butter pecan last night. That's your. Is that your favorite flavor? Uh, I mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You like pizza? Love pizza. Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite pizza? Um, I just got a white. Hamburg onion. I got to lighten this up somehow. <laughs> it's been a good life. It's been a good life up to this point, and we're just getting warmed up, really. So, what's the future, Warden? We don't know. That's the big topic right now. No, no, DOC. No. <laughs> what's the future for you, Warden? And I'm um, not talking about job. Yeah, I don't know. So, um, you know, I'm 54 now, so I may have 10 more years, and and. Um, I don't know what the what the future holds. Whatever whatever it brings, is going to have meaning and purpose, and it's going to is you know um, I have to do those things that are important to me, and that's what we do. You know, I I love that. I love having meaning and purpose and get out of bed. I, I and and this job feeds me that way. The army fed me that way. Whatever I was doing, and I had 23 years of army prior to the, going to combat, and and. Um, you know, as a military policeman, I enjoyed that, but I felt as though I wasn't a real soldier. And so as soon as I was able, I did my three-year enlistment, and then I joined the infantry after that, and I did 21 years in the infantry, and I felt like I was home there. That was like, I was born to be there. And then um, I was a drill sergeant for seven years, and that coaching, mentoring, being with those young children, because they're, they're kids, they're 18 years old, and, uh, con you know, working with them uh, was great. And then I taught at West Point for three years, and... Those kids are super sharp kids, and um, really the the best America has to offer. And um, and then I did the year in Iraq, so it was all meaningful, purposeful, like great assignments all the way through. Same in law enforcement. It was uh, whether I was diving or I did a lot of drug work. I felt a lot. Of, there's a lot of meaning in that. Um, I did some programming in the jail for substance abuse, mental health for veterans that were incarcerated. That was meaningful to me. I've always I've been blessed with with the great opportunities uh, to serve and and do some meaningful work and it's been wonderful really what advice do you have for people that are suffering from ptsd um i wouldn't say suffering um i would <laughs> wow <we're, laughs> no nah, really dude, yeah I, I don't suffer but some people do they do and um i would say that that um, people that are exposed to trauma and 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 combat and law enforcement corrections don't have a monopoly on the trauma piece so um, I, whenever I speak public I, about post-traumatic stress, I always talk about um, we don't own that. You know, it's a trauma from a vehicle accident, trauma from sexual assault, trauma from domestic violence. All of those traumas um, um, are equally as important as da as damaging. Um, but but for me, as it relates to law enforcement, corrections, and, and military, I would say that the, the the thing that's been most successful for me is is uh, pairing with a with a, uh, a mentor and. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a group that's called House in the Woods. Paul and Dee House lost their son in Baghdad in 2007, and, and as a result, they've created this hunting, fishing camp resort experience for any veteran and families that wants to go. So they talked me to go up there, and, and um, they wanted me to go bear hunting. And, and um, since I came back from Iraq, the chasing animals through the woods isn't, isn't what it used to be, you know, to kill them. Um, so, but anyways, I went, and so there I was sitting in a lawn chair with a bag of donuts hanging from a tree, so I'm like, what am I doing here? You know, I, I, making noise so the bear doesn't come in because I don't want to shoot anything. You know, and uh, anyways, but the the value of that was um, when I when I when I when I drove in there, the guide was a Vietnam veteran, and so what they do is very much on the light. It's just fellowship and mentorship. That's all they do. Is no no formal counseling, clinical work, and so we're driving along, and I think it was de deliberate. They went with the long way. Hey, Randy, how you doing? Good, you know. Uh, how'd you turn around? Go good, and and how things going since then? You know, just light probing, and uh, good. And he said, "Yeah, when I came back from from Vietnam, he said I had some relationship issues, and and everything okay, going okay at home." I said, uh, "Yeah, better now." What, what do you mean? Well, I came back, and six months later, I was divorced. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, what about uh, you know? And so we talked like that, and so he gave me his advice of the journey he traveled, and 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 he, his advice to me was, "Don't take thirty years to go get some help." 
Don't take 30 years to realize you have a drinking problem or you have an uh, anger problem or whatever the circumstance is. And, and that mentorship from my era of veterans, priceless from the Vietnam veterans. And so that was important. And then uh, the other thing is, is to, to group up and um, talk to people who have had shared experiences. And we do that with the veterans pod here. We have 51 veterans in, in one of the pods, and that's the veterans pod. And they have uh, shared experiences, same, same culture and language, and they understand each other. And, and they, do you go talk with them? Yeah, I'm out there a lot. And so um, and I show that off to anybody I can because I, I, I believe that when we send guys and gals off to war, uh, that uh, we have a duty to help them transition back, and sometimes that transition back is decades old. And some guy, guys and gals come back um, lightly impaired, and and uh, they, you know, and don't forget, you know, someone going, someone deploying. There are various levels of deployment for me, and so it's like going to a Fenway, going to Fenway, right? You're familiar with Fenway. I am. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, you go to Fenway, and because you're there, you could be selling peanuts, you could be cleaning the urinals, or you could be the pitcher. And so I kind of feel that way, and I'm very biased to the infantry, but I feel that um, because you deploy, and um, let's say you're a cook, and you stay on the base the whole time, and you're in Baghdad in the green zone, and uh, you, you have a swimming pool outside, and you have a PX and a Cinnabon and um, you know Burger King, that's one experience. And the other experience is the infantry Marine that flies into Baghdad, gets his equipment, and then goes to Anbar province and fights for seven months. That's a whole different experience, you know? Um, and so not, not all veterans have endured the same sort of burden of war. And uh, so it's important to remember that too. Um, but I, for me, it's about uh, getting a brotherhood together and, and being with them and, and having a safe place to talk and work that. And um, we even do that here. I have a veterans group here of employees that we meet here and, and talk. And uh, that, that's uh, liberating for some people, I think. And I think that the free talk of post-traumatic stress about yeah, me too, man. You know, we've got some demons and we're okay. Let's just take care of each other and, and fight through the fight and, and we'll be okay in the end. Mm -hmm. Do you think of your life as blessed? It is blessed. I have a, I have a, I have a great life. I have many blessings. I say that a lot. And I, and I tell that to everybody. That, you know, I know the difference between uh, the poverty in some of the areas in Korea, the poverty in Iraq. Um, I've had the benefit of being able to, I've traveled to, I think I'm up to 15 countries now. We just came back from Thailand in the spring. Um, I, I, I know real poverty and, um, and um, we're blessed in this country to have um, the food and the warmth and the comforts that we have here. I'm also blessed to have a wonderful family. Um, Do you think you could have gone, easily gone in a different direction? I clearly would have gone the other direction. Um, you know, um, growing up, my father was very much, um, he, he had criminal thinking, pure criminal thinking. That's what he did. He was always, I'll give you for instance, so like probably in 1976, Christmas morning, um, there are no gifts under the tree. And there are no gifts because he doesn't work. And, and if he did work, he was drinking it up and chasing women. And so uh, wake up Christmas morning, no gifts. And so what he does is he looks across the street and he sees a 10-seat ten, ten toboggan. Beautiful one, walnut maple, fancy padded. He goes over on the porch and grabs it and brings it over to the house. Merry Christmas, kids. You know, and so uh, that was his thinking. Take what you want. And uh, the law enforcement officer shows up and, and knocks on the door. And, and my dad opens the door and, and he says, uh, Hey, Ronnie, I got to talk to you about. Uh, did you take a toboggan? And of course, he says, Do you have a warrant? Get the f out of my house. That's it. You know. And then so that night we uh, we threw the toboggan in the back of the truck. And um, he had an old junkie truck, and we went out to some back roads uh, in Kennebec County, and he pulled us behind the toboggan in the truck going 50 miles an hour. We thought it was the greatest thing, you know, <laughs> up and down the roads. But he was just a criminal thinker. Uh, my brother Ryan tells a story of my dad came home and said, Hey, Ryan, um, you want to make some money? And Ryan's 10 at the time. Why, Dad? What, what, you know, he said, I just stole a change jar off one of the counters in one of the stores, and the cops are chasing me, so I ran up the tracks and threw it in the, in the bushes. You go get that, and I'll go halves with you. That kind of just, you know, yeah. And uh, the charge, he, um, and it wasn't on the light. I mean, I remember as a, as a first grader, he was on the, on, in a, we had an apartment on the second floor, and he had a, a 30 out 6 out the window, and was a, the police officer was running radar, and he felt as though the law enforcement officer had wronged him, disrespected him somehow, and he's going to shoot him. So all those kids are like, don't shoot him, Dad, don't shoot him. We, we, you know, oh, yeah. Um, 
you know, last time he was at the house was in probably 77. He came home drunk and he said, Trina, I've got bad news. And, and, and my mother's like, what's, what is it now, Ronnie? And he said, I got a girl pregnant. And uh, so a domestic ensued, police showed up and, and uh, that's the first time I smelled mace, OC. Um, they maced my father and hauled him off, you know? So there's a lot of that. And he was in jail the last time when I guarded him, um, he stole a truck and, um, and he, had, he had gotten arrested for that. And then the witness that had turned him in, um, he went broke into her house and killed her animals. Yeah, not on the light. This wasn't light stuff. And a lot of domestic violence, a lot of beating on my mother and, and all that stuff, you know. So, um, you know, we talk about blessings and, and all of that. I feel like uh, I have many blessings and uh, to live the life that I have now. And um, Did and you I, ever get in the middle of him beating your mother? Too young. You know, I was always uh, five, six, seven years old, something like that. And uh, so we were always too young to, to be able to really um, get in the way of that. Do but, you regret that? Um, no, too young. Too young. Put that one aside. I, nothing I could do as a five, six-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but the um, um, you know, the, but my father um, was always very loving and nurturing to us. And so, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was bizarre. It was uh, so aggressive with my mother. Never spanked us, never raised his hand to us, didn't raise his voice to us, hugged us, loved us, till the day he died. Give me a hug, love you. Did love. his father beat his mother? Uh, a lot of, you know, we multi-generational mess. And so um, my uh, grandfather, Romeo, I never met him, severe alcoholic, um, domestic violence in that home too, ran off on his wife. Um, they had seven children. You know, they lived in deep, deep poverty. Um, he died an alcoholic on the streets of Boston. Um, they went and retrieved his body, I think in 67, 68, something like that. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of multi-generational dysfunction, alcoholism, broken homes. My mother's adopted, my grandfather's adopted. Did you make a decision that this insanity stops with me? Um, you know, for us, I don't think it was a conscious decision, but I think my brothers and I, um, we were fortunate to have uh, um, coaches um, football coaches and um, um, track coaches, basketball coaches, and and um, along the way, these well-meaning, well-intentioned men. You know, as a young man, as a as a teenager, as a as a younger boy, I look at these guys and like, wow, look at the way he talks to his wife with respect, and he's articulate, and he has a job, and he's late for practice today because he had to work an overtime shift, and that's how real people live. And then um, we were fortunate to. Are you ever late for a shift? No, I try to be the first one here. <laughs> I'm sorry, continue. Yeah, um, I leave my house at 5.50 to get down here. I'm, I'm doing an hour and 15 down here. Um, so uh, um, I, uh, my brother Ron is the oldest, and so he um, joined the Army his senior year, and then I did the same thing. And so I went to visit him at, at Fort Devons, Mass., which is just Devons now, right? Mm -hmm. And um, um, I've, I've, I did seven years with a DOD branch, so I've, oh, been, really? I've been at Devons. Yeah, I went to drill sergeant school there. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, um, when I went to visit him, um, he had a he had a barracks room and and uh, he had hot water even, mm -hmm. which we didn't have, and um, um, so it was just a he lived well and, and his second year in it he bought a Ford EXP which is a tiny little Ford, and the first time I smelled new car smell, and my uncle signed co-signed for him and he was living good so I'm like I want a part of that, mm -hmm. so um, my senior year November of my senior year, I joined also, and then my brother Rick joined and and so that gave us. As teenagers, formative years, we had that positive male role modeling as a drill sergeant and then and other non-commissioned officers that were in charge of us, and that set us, I think. We all were in at least till we are 21, and then we had the college money, and we took off. Yeah, it was good after that. Yeah. Do you like music? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a, on the way in here, I was listening to Springsteen, and um, who doesn't, right? And, um, you know, ACDC, Aerosmith. Um, so what's your favorite song? Um, I like 41 Shots, Springsteen's a good one. That's, I just listened to that on the way down here. Um, you yeah. listen to that a lot, that song? Um, yeah, I, I pull that one up. Yeah. yeah, You like that one? I'm not that familiar with it. I uh, do like yeah. Springsteen, I do. It's, uh, so he, that's the one where he got in some trouble with the cops because uh, the, they, they shot, I forget the, the, the black kid's name, but they shot him, the cops shot him 41 times and the lyrics are just beautiful the way that the mother has to talk to the son about the son about what about um, <clears throat> you
you did well with that one. <laughs> it's about about law enforcement, you know, shooting a young black man unarmed, and he pulled up, and it's a wallet. Is it a gun? What is it? And um, and so the the mother talking to the son about if the stop if the cops stop you, don't run, be respectful, keep your hands up, that kind of thing. Pull that up, you'll you'll see what I mean. I will. Yeah, I it's, promise. It's a good I will. one. It's a it's a good one. It's powerful. You know, I, I know this is meant for an audience, but I, I needed to hear this. Thank you. That was a very intense interview. It was a struggle for everyone in the room, certainly me. I honestly can't find the words to describe what it was like meeting him and talking to Randall Liberty. He's like cut from stone. And then to see him break down over and over again (laughs) it was really intense maybe I'm speaking for myself I don't I don't think so but I know from suffering from depression when you hear somebody else who suffers from a mental illness talk about it and you hear about their history I'm not saying that you size each other up but There is a comparison process. It does make it easier to to empathize and sympathize. I mean, I I find it very easy for myself to connect with other people who suffer from mental illness. That said, sometimes when I hear their stories, I sometimes say to myself, well, what's your problem? You know, you didn't experience that. What you went through was nothing compared to what this person went through. And it's a terrible way to think. And if anybody out there thinks that way, I'd recommend to try and not to invalidate or belittle your experience. We all suffer in our own way. That's just how it is. My experiences are mine, yours are yours. And we've all been given different tools to deal with those situations. So if you're suffering out there and you listen to Warden Liberty's story and it actually makes you feel worse about your own experiences, I, I'd recommend that you talk to somebody about that. Because um, to be depressed and then to invalidate your depression, um, man, that can lead to a, a really, really dark place really fast. It's one thing to suffer and to take care of yourself, and then there's another thing to suffer and then feel like you're not worthy of help or assistance just because you feel that what you went through is nothing compared to what somebody else went through. That's a tough way to live. And uh, I've done it a few times and I just don't recommend doing that at all. Find somebody to talk to. Okay, give me some feedback. I'd like to hear some feedback. Let me know what you think of this pie. Yeah, this is an intense one. Let me know what you think. We'll be back in two weeks in that time. I'm going to have my kitty back with me. Maybe I'll bring her on the the podcast. I'm sure she has a lot to say. Like, shut up and let me sleep. Or, feed me and then leave me alone. You know, that's usually standard protocol with a cat. But, hey, I love it. See you guys in two weeks. Thank you for listening to Mindful Things, the official podcast of McLean Hospital. Please subscribe to us and rate us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any suggestions for special topics or future guests, email us at mindfulthings at mclean.org. And don't forget, mental health is everyone's responsibility. If you or a loved one are in crisis, the Samaritans are available 24 hours a day at 877-870-4673. Again, that's 877-870-4673. Four six seven three.